poltergeists are a subsect of the paranormal that's both fascinating and terrifying in equal measures. From objects moving by themselves to wall writings, water leaks and phantom fires, there are hundreds of poltergeist hauntings from all across the world. But for the purpose of this video I'm only going to be talking about the Great British Poltergeist stories. From the well known to the more obscure and in some cases the downright bizarre, I'll take you through some truly terrifying poltergeist stories. Hi, I'm Mike and if you've got your K2 at the ready, let's go find some ghosts. Chapter 1 The Enfield Poltergeist Let's start with possibly the most famous British poltergeist case, the Enfield Haunting. The Enfield Haunting relates to a haunted house at number 284 Green Street in Enfield, London, where between the years of 1977 and 1979, the residents of the house were subjected to a horrific ordeal. The activity seemed to centre around sisters Janet, aged 11, and Margaret, aged 13, who lived with their single mother Peggy and a couple of other siblings. The activity started in 1977 when Peggy witnessed furniture moving of its own accord and the children could hear phantom knocking noises on the house's walls. A local policeman was called to investigate the strange goings on and reportedly saw a chair wobble and slide without any obvious cause for its movement. On a side note, I always find it funny when the police are called in to deal with hauntings. I understand that people often don't know where to turn, but unless there have been some major advancements in police technology, I doubt they're going to be able to arrest a ghost. Later claims from the Enfield haunting include disembodied voices, loud bangs on the walls, and the children being levitated. Over the next 18 months, journalists, paranormal investigators, and even the family's neighbours attended the property to see if they could determine the cause of the ghostly goings on. With a lot of these people claiming that they saw the furniture moving, the sisters levitating, and at one point the poltergeist speaking through Janet. This is quite possibly the most convincing and harrowing aspect for me, as daughter Janet was able to produce a very gruff voice for hours on end. This gave the researchers information about the previous owner of the house who had died there, which she would have had no way of knowing, and in some instances this information was actually accurate and confirmed by the previous owner's son. The researchers apparently even went as far as filling her mouth with water and all the while she was still able to produce the voice. Here is a clip of the creepy voice that I am talking about. Hello, my name is Morris. Let me hear you say it. Now that was the first time we heard the voice and since then we've been hearing it again and again and it's been getting louder and louder. I'm invisible. I'm invisible. You're invisible. Why are you invisible? I'm a G H O S T. Because I'm a G H O S T. This voice is coming from an eleven year old girl. Well, Pat's guy, Pat, you've got something to say to them. Yeah! I'd like to know how you make this noise without bashing Janet's vocal cords to pieces if I do yeah. it for half a minute. The house was investigated by paranormal researcher Maurice Gross, who the two sisters, or the two daughters, instantly took a liking to. Maurice was very thorough with his investigation, and when it was time for him to leave, it is believed that the girls started acting up and possibly even faking activity, such as the infamous picture of one of the girls levitating that you can see on screen now. To me, this is a picture of a child jumping off a bed, but I wasn't there so I can't say for certain, but this certainly looks like it is something that could be very easily hoaxed. Famed demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren also turned up at the property for a couple of hours, before pretty much being told we don't need your help by the team who were already investigating the property, despite how The Conjuring 2 movie makes this look. Eventually the poltergeist activity subsided and then disappeared altogether. Various pieces of media have been made around the haunting as it's so famous, such as movies, books and even a couple of theatre shows. Along with the Enfield haunting being famous, it is also infamous due to claims of fakery and fraud on the part of the system. At one point I believe they even admitted to pranking the press, which throws the entire case into doubt. And like almost every famous haunted case, there is some level of fakery or doubt that goes along with it. The saving grace for the Enfield haunting is that so many people witnessed activity within the house over such an extended period of time. 
And I know this is a very brief overview of the Enfield haunting, but if you would like to know more, pop a comment below letting me know, and I'll make a dedicated video on this case going much deeper. Chapter 2 The Battersea Poltergeist in January 1956, 15 year old Shirley Hitchings of 63 Wycliffe Road in Battersea, London, discovered a silver key sitting on her pillow. Her father tried the key in every lock in the house, but it did not fit any of them. This was the beginning of the family's 12 years of torment at the hands of a poltergeist that they affectionately named Donald. The haunted activity included furniture moving of its own accord, phantom notes allegedly written by the poult and even objects suddenly catching fire. The haunting seemed to centre around Shirley whose teenage years were marred by the poltergeist's focus. The same night Shirley discovered the silver key, the haunting started with deafening bangs that reverberated around the entire house shaking its walls. They were so loud that at one point the neighbours complained and Shirley recalled that no one could pinpoint where the noises were actually coming from. The noises continued for a number of weeks, evolving into scratching sounds that were apparently coming from inside the furniture. Neither the police nor surveyors could get to the bottom of where the noises were coming from, and various reporters who visited the property were left unsettled upon visiting the house. Like most poltergeist cases, over time the activity got more extreme, with multiple witnesses claiming to have seen bedsheets flying off of beds, slippers walking around of their own accord, clocks floating through the air, pots and pans being thrown across rooms and chairs moving around the house. The phantom noises even followed Shirley to work and, and this is an interesting point that although poltergeists are often associated with haunted houses, it would appear that they actually haunt people more and what a terrifying thought that is. Shirley actually lost her job and friends due to the ongoing poltergeist activity as many believed that she was actually possessed and the activity changed again causing Shirley to levitate while she was in her bed around the room. From around March 1956 onwards the Hitchings family began to draw press attention, photographers lingered outside their house and many believed that the poltergeist was a figment of Shirley's imagination and that she was purposely stirring up the story for attention. Eventually the Daily Mail got in touch and Shirley was invited to their head office where she was strip searched to ensure that she wasn't hiding anything. Remember this is a 15 year old girl we're talking about. The paper then published a sensationalist account of the story which attracted more and more widespread attention. An attempt was even made by the BBC to contact Donald on primetime TV and the haunting went as far as being spoken about in the House of Commons. Paranormal investigator Harold Chib Chibbit was drawn to the case he made extensive records on the case and genuinely believed in the Battersea poltergeist. Chip spent days and nights recording events at the house and eventually became a close friend to the Hitchings. He even wrote a very detailed book about the case but unfortunately it was never published. As time went on, Donald the poltergeist would become increasingly violent, spontaneous fires would break out and rooms would be found completely trashed and symbols of crosses and the fleur-de-lis also started appearing on walls. Exorcisms were attempted on the house and the family would go through the alphabet waiting for knocks on certain letters to communicate. This was sort of a precursor to the Ouija board where rather than having a physical board to touch you would go through the alphabet and wait for a sound on the letters and then basically make words and sentences from that. This then even evolved into handwritten messages from the Pult with the first being, Shirley, I come. There was also a message written that said, subscribe. And I think you better do what Donald says because we really don't want to make him angry here. From March 1956, Donald left notes around the house ordering the family to do things such as dress Shirley in courtly clothes and contact famous actor Jeremy Spencer which weirdly led to a breakthrough in the case. In a handwritten letter in May 1956, Donald identified himself as Louis Charles, the short-lived Louis XVII of France. Louis was rumoured to have escaped during the French Revolution rather than dying a prisoner aged 10 which was later proved. Donald or Louis used a number of elaborate French phases in his letter and claimed that he had drowned en route to exile in England. His story however fascinating was often changing and contradictory and this is quite indicative of poltergeists being pranksters or tricksters or not always giving you the whole truth. By 1968 Shirley had married and moved out of the family home and Donald had also left leaving a note announcing his departure saying I go. A funny note on this is that Shirley's mother seemed to suffer some form of Stockholm syndrome and said that she actually missed Donald after he left. Like the Enfield haunting, there is a lot of speculation that some of the activity was actually being caused by Shirley, who was considered a bored teenager who manufactured Donald to gain some attention. 
Handwriting experts also inspected the letters from Donald and are almost certain that they were written by Shirley. Personally, I'm on the fence on this one as, again, there are multiple witnesses over a long period of time which adds validity to the case, but also there are elements of fakery and fraud involved with it. And if you would like a much, much more comprehensive look at this case, Danny Robbins has made a fantastic podcast series all about the Battersea Poltergeist for the BBC. Chapter 3, The Coventry Poltergeist. Moving on to a lesser known poltergeist case, we'll talk about the Coventry Poltergeist. Interestingly, this poltergeist is the most modern entry on this list, with reports of the haunting happening in 2011 at the home of Lisa Manning and her children Ellie 11 and Jaden 6 in Coventry. The family claimed that the rented home was haunted by a poltergeist and that strange activity had happened there since the moment they walked in. Lisa claimed that the activity included pots and pans being thrown around, the blinds in various rooms moving up and down of their own accord, lights switching themselves on and off, and drawers opening up by themselves. Lisa was originally sceptical when her children and partner Anthony complained of strange happenings in the house, but she started to believe that there was a poltergeist in the home when she found her dog seriously injured at the bottom of the stairs. She took the pet to the vet where it unfortunately passed away and she says that the vet believed its injuries were from the dog being pushed down the stairs. Lisa decided to set up a video camera to try and capture what was going on. Footage appears to show a chair moving across Ellie's bedroom by itself with Ellie adding, I'm scared to go home and I don't want to go upstairs on my own. Acting on the advice of mediums, Lisa decided to scatter her house with salt, put crucifixes up and start to wear a crystal for protection. The family decided to have a priest come and exercise the house, but much like many poltergeist cases, this only served to make the activity worse. Lisa added, The problem is, because we can't see it, we don't know where it's going to be or what it's going to do. This is a horror house. It's like living in a scary movie. The worst thing about it is, even I can't believe what's happening myself. The activity went away for a short period of time, but when it returned, it started taking new forms such as disembodied footsteps before all the lights in the house would turn off simultaneously. The poult even went as far as locking the entire family in the living room, and when Ellie went to open the door, she shouted at Anthony to stop holding it shut, not realising that he was standing behind her. The family eventually had to get out of the room via a window. The Coventry Poltergeist gained attention from minor celebrities, such as Derek Acora from Most Haunted and Mary Loves Dick fame. Mary Loves Dick. Mary Loves Dick. Who came to the house to try and help resolve the case. The producer of the movie When the Lights Went Out, a movie about another famed poltergeist case, also interviewed Lisa, and you can still find the video of this interview if you search Coventry Poltergeist. Like many poltergeist cases, there were calls that the activity was a hoax, and the poltergeist activity eventually dissipated and stopped altogether. No one's really sure for certain, though, if this is just a publicity stunt or if there was actually any truth in this poltergeist haunting. Chapter 4 Jeff the Mongoose. The last entry in this video is possibly the most bizarre and unlike the other poltergeist cases that we have covered. Jeff, Jeff the Mongoose, or the Dalby Spook, is a poltergeist case that originates from the Isle of Man in the 1930s. Jeff is said to have inhabited a farmhouse owned by the Irving family, and the Irving's farm was located at Cashin's Gap near the hamlet of Dalby. Dalby Spook. The Irving family, James, Margaret, and a 13-year-old daughter called Vori, claimed they heard persistent scratching, rustling, and vocal noises behind their farmhouse's wooden wall panels that seemed to resemble some kind of dog or ferret. According to the Irvings, a creature named Jeff introduced itself and told them that it was a mongoose born in New Delhi, India in 1852. Vori claimed to see the mischievous mongoose and claimed that Jeff was the size of a small rat with yellowish fur and a large bushy tail. The Irvings claimed that Jeff had communicated to them that he was an extra extra clever mongoose, an earthbound spirit and a ghost in the form of a mongoose. And even go as far as once even saying, I am a freak, I have hands and I have feet and if you saw me you'd faint, you'd be petrified, mummified, turned into a pillar of salt. Seems like he is very, very well educated for a mongoose. But again, poltergeists often seem to lie and stretch the truth to make it appear as if they are something that they're not, when in reality what they actually are no one can really say for certain. The Irvings made various claims about Jeff. He supposedly guarded their house and informed them of the approach of guests or unfamiliar dogs. 
and if someone forgot to put out a fire at night, Jeff would go down and stop the stove. Jeff would also wake up people when they overslept. The family gave Jeff biscuits, chocolates and bananas with food left for him in a saucer suspended from the ceiling, which he took when he thought no one was watching, and the mongoose regularly accompanied the family on trips to the market. Journalists and investigators including Harry Price flocked to the farmhouse with some claiming to have heard Jeff's incessant chatting and on some occasions even seeing him. Physical evidence however was lacking, footprints, stains on the walls and hair samples claimed to be evidence of Jeff were identified as belonging to the Irving's sheepdog as were several photos which the Irvings claimed to depict Jeff. Margaret and Vori left the home in 1945 after the death of James Irving and they reportedly had to sell the farmer to loss because it had a reputation of being haunted with the new owner claiming that he shot and killed Jeff but the body produced didn't actually match any of the eyewitness accounts. Vori died in 2005 and in an interview later in life she maintained that Jeff was not her creation and there was no fakery on their part. As some final thoughts there are some common themes in the types of activity across poltergeist cases mentioned in this video and beyond. They more often than not include an adolescent child, in most cases a girl, and there is a hypothesis to believe that poltergeists could be manifestations of the emotions of teenagers transitioning into adulthood. A kind of emotional release that is so powerful that teenagers are able to subconsciously affect their surroundings. This is only one hypothesis and there is a whole myriad around poltergeists and what they could be. No one knows for certain, but to learn more we need more long-term research and to delve deeper into the similarities across poltergeist cases. This can be very difficult however because trying to recreate the circumstances of a poltergeist haunting is almost impossible. Anyway, I've rambled on like Jeff the Mongoose in this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Watch this video next for three more terrifying poltergeist cases 